So this morning uh, when I came, uh, I had the surprise to be elected as chairman in this important section, opening section of the uh, uh, very famous uh, uh, speakers. The first one is uh, Michele Parinello, who speaks about uh, proteins in small motion. Please, Michele. I... On behalf, just a moment, Michele. On behalf of the Chemical right. Society, oh, I want to you. present to you with a, a little oh, right. medal. The medal and the tie. And I have to change my tie then immediately. <laughs> I will do after the talk. Thank you. Okay, it's a small room in any case. So, uh, uh, so the subject of today will be uh, proteins and their uh, dynamical behavior, in uh, particular the slow, long time behavior. Uh, we all familiar with this picture of a land free energy landscape of protein, which normally is represented as a two state. Uh, situation where you can go from the unfolded to the folded uh, to the folded configuration uh, via via barrier and many proteins behave like that and associated there is a, a, a landscape uh, which uh, can be uh, there's a typical uh, tunnel uh, like uh, uh, funnel like uh, landscape which corresponds to the situation of fast fold and then uh, many other variants of that. And under the, especially driven in the past by the great success of crystallographer, we tend to associate uh, to proteins in the folded state uh, a very well-defined structure, but that's not uh, uh, always the case. And in recent years, uh, uh, increasing interest has been paid to the so-called intrinsically disordered protein. Uh, so there are proteins we have, which even in their equilibrium state, they don't have a well-defined structure, either totally disordered or there are parts of the protein uh, that uh, can be disordered, that are disordered, and the fact that they are disordered, this part of the protein is disordered, is important for their functional behavior. And, uh, Unfortunately, the screen is not, uh, but here there is a list of different uh, proteins and uh, their, uh, their, uh, which are relevant for, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, our discussion. So not having a very definite structure it means they are very dynamical. And, uh, and of course, uh, molecular dynamics would be the natural framework in which to treat uh, and study this protein. The problem, however, that the motion of this protein occurs in the time scale of milliseconds and beyond, and we are at a loss with present computers, at least if you're not a billionaire, like the show, to attack these problems. And the reason for time scale is multifold. Uh, one is uh, the existence of a barrier uh, between one conformer and the other, and the barrier, of course, of the rate of transition of the barrier is determined by the height of the transition state. And also there are other more complicated situations where you have slow diffusion, if you have uh, uh, entropic barriers, and so on and so forth. And uh, on top of it, even the case in which uh, the two uh, 
the two states, the reactant and the product, are separated, are well separated, and uh, it's not a diffusion limited process. In a, in a real protein, and in many, many complex systems which we are really interested in, the, the landscape is very complicated. It's multi scale, and uh, also there is a variety of times associated with this motion, and there are different uh, uh, pathways between one minimum and the other. So what we need to do is, uh, is uh, to devise uh, both a method that allows us to explore the free energy landscape of the system, but also a language and tools uh, to describe uh, what, uh, what really is happening. Of course, we are but certainly not the first. Uh, to, to worry about this problem, and the, the speaker of this afternoon, also in the, uh, uh, Emily, Emily has developed a uh, long time ago, I must say, uh, uh, her own version of this, uh, of this approach. But uh, there are many, many, many things that have been recognized uh, by the community as a key point. Uh, uh, and what we have done, uh, we are, <coughs> we, we, the method that we have been working on for the last uh, Essentially, since I moved to Lugano, ten uh, in excess of ten, ten years, uh, is we call it metadynamics. <clears throat> and I'll go briefly because I'm afraid uh, many of you have already heard uh, this part of the talk, but uh, uh, young people that might not be as familiar. So, <clears throat> first we have to, as I said, we have to uh, develop uh, a language for describing uh, this complicated system, so we have to identify a, a small number of relevant uh, collective variables that are able to describe the conformer. We, we, have, we will have a small example of what goes on of uh, these uh, collective variables. And, uh, and then we focus our attention on the so-called free energy surface rather than the potential energy surface. A free energy surface, uh, since you you integrate over uh, rapid fluctuations is smoother uh, as, as, as compared to the potential energy surface, which instead is very rough. So these are examples of collective variables. Of course, it depends on the physics. And just uh, the best is to illustrate uh, uh, what they are with examples. I have a couple of examples. So the free energy surface uh, is, of course, related to, there is no pointer. Okay, so the free energy surface is, of course, uh, uh, related to the probability distribution of this so-called collective variable, that's a Boltzmann average, and uh, the free energy surface is minus KBT, the logarithm of the probability distribution. And, uh, and so when there is high probability, there is a minimum. When there is low probability, there is a, uh, uh, the, if you have a saddle point, uh, this uh, gives you an idea of the transition state. Uh, as a way, in the way of an example, I take uh, uh, alanine dipeptide, which uh, many people have studied. Uh, so the conformation of the alanine dipeptide can be described in terms of these two Ramachandran angles. We can, uh, we can represent the free energy as a function of the Ramachandran angle. You see there are uh, minima huh? and also transition pathways between one minimum to the other. Uh, uh, the various minima correspond to different possible metastable conformers of this uh, protein. And they've been studied and labeled accordingly. OK. Uh, so that's the language. Then how are we going to explore, uh, explore the, the free energy surface? Uh, we started, as I said, uh, more than 10 years ago with Alessandro Laio, who is now in uh, Trieste, uh, and uh, so we work on this free energy surface uh, using molecular dynamics. But wherever we go, we add a small repulsive Gaussian. And so we discarded the system for coming back uh, in regions where have been visited. And uh, so, so as uh, our worker, 
uh, moves on this free energy space, and then the various uh, minimum are filled, and uh, the asymptotic behavior of the system is, is such in which you have totally flattened the landscape, and the bias are that it's equal within to minus the underlying free energy surface. So you, you, this is, as I said, it's an old paper, and we have developed uh, now further and in a more sophisticated way, so introducing what we call well-tempered metadynamics. So this is uh, our uh, Newton's equation. Here we have the bias, which depends on the collective coordinate. The bias is time dependent. And now the height of the barrier depends on its previous history. So if you visit the place, the Gaussian that you add becomes smaller and smaller. And there is in the theory gamma a boosting factor, which is a handle which we can turn at our will. And uh, the properties of this dynamics uh, are rather interesting. You can look at it uh, as uh, in the conventional metadynamics. So the bias is equal to the free energy. In this case, you have uh, a factor. So it's not simply minus, but there is a proportionality factor, which depends on gamma. But the way I like it uh, to look at it better is to say that, uh, that it, I change the fluctuations in the variable s. So because you can show that there is this relation between the fluctuations, the probability distribution in the canonical ensemble, and that uh, in the so we call well-tempered ensemble. So if I make gamma larger, the fluctuations will grow. So there is a way of inducing uh, criticality. So just I illustrate uh, this point uh, uh, with the uh, with alanine dipeptide. So if I have uh, gamma equal to one, means uh, I don't do anything, that's in the canonical ensemble, I stay in this minimum, and I don't visit the other minimum. Now I have this gamma and do metadynamics, the fluctuations here are increased, so it increases the probability of going over the barrier, and you see this happening. And if I increase gamma even more, I visit more and more regions of my, of my free energy space, Gamma equal to infinity leads us uh, to the old way of doing metadynamics. OK, so enough uh, for the introduction. So this will be the base of our thing. And I'll, I'll, I'm afraid I have to read it. Otherwise, you, you cannot. Uh, huh? So what we are going to look at uh, is the fibritin foldon domain. So fibritin is. Uh, it's part of the muscle system. It's a trimeric object. And at the bottom of it, there is a, a, a group of three proteins, <coughs> which is the so-called foldon domain. And they assist the assembly of, of this three fibritin, of the fibritin fiber. And they are shaped are main important. We, we, we can't go into detail, but it's highly, highly important because they act as a chaperone in many situations. So they help the trimerization. Huh? Every time they see three proteins like, they tend to assemble them together. OK. So, so we look at the, at the little bit at the bottom. And it's a, a trimer. Um, the trimer has structure has been solved by NMR. And uh, it's supposed the kinetic uh, data suggests that uh, it forms in a multi-step process, and namely first the integration of two, and then the third one comes. The, the, protein, the structure of, uh, of the monomer has not been solved, but there is a, a, a mutant uh, which is stable enough for, for it to be solved. And it has a beta sheet, uh, and it has this tail uh, uh, which forms. Uh, uh, it's a disorder tail there. Uh, so we do 
we do our metadynamics. So, and for the time being, so we use, we combine metadynamics with parallel tempering. And uh, for the time being, I want you to point to this large number. And I'll come back to that. So we, for doing this calculation, uh, that was done like five, six years ago, we needed uh, 80 replicas. So we combine metadynamics with parallel tempering. And what do we use as collective variable? We use uh, uh, the native uh, alpha carbon contacts with respect to the trimeric experimental structure. Another, another collective coordinate is the radius of duration, which will tell us how, how expanded it is. And <coughs> as a way of calculating the, 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 the energy or the stability of the system, we look at the total number of backbone uh, hydrogen bonds. Uh, we do our simulation, and uh, we find uh, that there are three possible tri minimum in the free energy space. One corresponds uh, more or less uh, to the structure uh, that, that this monomer has in the trimer when there is a, a partially unfolded uh, situation and uh, a totally uh, unfolded thing. And uh, here this, uh, I don't know whether you can see, uh, I superimpose, we superimpose a number of structure coming from this minimum. Uh, the thick line correspond to the NMR structures, which you find in the PDB. And uh, this is our MD, and you see very much covers. But here in this tail, there is a lot more disorder than in the PDB uh, data set. Uh, we, we can use our simulation to calculate the NMR, the NMR uh, shift uh, using some standard tool that connects uh, conform conformation of the protein to chemical shift. So this is from Cambridge, the other from another group. And we calculate the error that is made by using the published PDB structures. And with our uh, simulation, we find a much smaller error. So our vision of this protein having a part which is uh, in, in the monomeric state, which is highly disordered, is uh, uh, supported by, by uh, this analysis. Of course, I mean, this uh, uh, program, have, uh, uh, there's a big question mark, how accurate is the prediction of the NMR shift. OK, so having done the monomer, uh, we, did, we did the dimer, and using, of course, a different collective variable. And this is the free energy uh, uh, surface. And the, the dimer can be can assembled into a parallel and an anti-parallel anti arrangement. Huh? And actually, the anti-parallel is slightly more favored. The parallel is what they have in the trimer. Uh, finally, we add the, the third thing. So we suppose that the dimer has been formed, and we look for the third, uh, third monomer to be added on, and you see the trimerization. It's a beautiful fun. So once the dimer is formed, it's all downhill. The third guy comes in and locks it to form, to form the trimeric structure. Uh, we don't have a real dynamics, but we can sort of get an idea of how things proceed by looking at the number of contacts that are formed as a function of the distance. And uh, uh, a, long, a larger distance is this flexible uh, tail that uh, contacts that are formed, and as they come close, the native contact becomes uh, become more and more favored. And uh, where there is uh, this picture of uh, fly casting, which has been uh, uh, introduced by, by uh, Peter Volinis. Uh, so that uh, the idea is, uh, for instance, in this interaction between protein and DNA, is that the mobile part of the protein it moves around, uh, 
and can more easily touch where it's going, and the, the presence of the funnel then helps uh, the, uh, the formation of the structure. So, so this is uh, what you get uh, from the structure in the dimer, and this is what you get from the simulation of the monomer. So between the X-ray and, 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 uh, and uh, in the trimer and the MD, there's a, a big, uh, big discrepancy. OK. Uh, OK, so, so we had, uh, uh, we, we could, uh, so this is to show that the method, if you have uh, appropriate collective variable, can go a long way to solving complicated uh, uh, problems. Huh? Uh, but of course, uh, in the method, everything, or oh, a lot, depends on the appropriate choice of collective variable. If you get the wrong collective variable, you forget some important motion, which is crucial for going from A to B, then you're in trouble. So what, uh, what are we doing to, uh, to, to alleviate this problem? One thing we have already seen, so we combine metadynamics with other sampling methods. We have seen that we using parallel tempering, and so that you can explore with temperature configurations, so supplement the metadynamics with the exploration of parallel tempering. The other is to find a smart collective variable, and we don't have time, so I will skip the, the thing. This is the this is work of Branduardi, path variables. And we look uh, uh, what happens uh, if you use the energy, uh, the potential energy of the system as collective variable. And finally, it, okay, this is something we are still are working on, so trying to find the uh, automatic way from the simulation to detect uh, the collective variable. Okay, so what happens if I use uh, the energy as a collective variable? As I said, uh, the, the effect of well temper metadynamics uh, on the collective variable is to enhance the fluctuations of that variable. So if you use the energy, it is uh, if uh, the specific heat was divergence, because the fluctuations of the energy is the specific heat. And I can regulate uh, the amplitude of the fluctuations by this uh, gamma parameter. And for the easy model, you can see here that as a function of gamma, uh, the fluctuations increase, uh, but the, the, the expectation value of the energy remains put. So it is like a, a good ensemble for statistical mechanics. In fact, we call well-tempered ensemble. So this doesn't require, in principle, uh, and so very often you need only to do that and don't need to introduce other variables. But of course there can be hidden degrees of freedom that uh, can play trick. But this is, and also the, the nice thing, uh, again I don't have much time to explain why, but uh, if I combine the will temperance
Ah, questo è difficile. I'm Italian, I have to wave my hands, I can't talk with the microphone. Yeah, that, uh, reminds me of, okay. It's a joke, I will, not, I will spare the joke. <laughs> If you want, I can tell you over coffee. Okay, anyhow, so, so here, so we have this uh, Kicks domain, this is the allosteric ligand, and this is the sub substrate, PKID, and uh, this has been studied by a group in Austria with which we collaborate, uh, and Martin Tollinger is the main, the main, the main And uh, So what has been shown that in the presence of ML, of MLL, the affinity to PKID uh, changes. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, on the basis of some empirical evidence, which I, I will tell you about, uh, what Tollinger, Tollinger came out with, the, with this uh, hypothesis that uh, if you take the dimeric complex. Uh, So MLL and KIX, uh, the, uh, there's a uh, population, this is a so-called excited state. Most of the time, uh, the uh, kicks uh, is in one conformation, but occasionally it can be excited to a different conformation for a fraction of the, of the time. And when it is in this, in this excited conformation, the uh, the substrate can bind more easily. And, and so, and the hypothesis, the structure of the trimer is, is similar to the structure of the excited state. But of course, NMR, since this is a short-lived thing, has not the resolution of determining the structure of the excited state. So these are the experimental information that we have. I think by now they are published. So this is the dimer structure from NMR, and this is the trimer. A very similar structure, actually. Nothing very dramatic has happened. Okay. It's me or? No, okay. Oh. Oh, it's out there. Okay. So as I said, the NMR people, if you are in the situation where I have two conformers, <coughs> if the rate of, of transformation between one conformer and the other is slow, then they will see two signals. One for conformation A and the other for conformation B. If uh, the transformation between A and B is fast, so it's uh, of the order of the resolution NMR, which is millisecond or faster, then it moves very fast and we see an average uh, between the two. So that's why they can't, uh, can't really. But they have a technique, which I don't, again, I don't understand, which is called the binary relaxation dispersion, which they do some uh, funny combination of, of uh, pulses in their machine. And by looking at this uh, particular decay, they can determine that there are two conformers. They don't know the structure of the excited conformers. That uh, the, the, the transformation between one conformer and the other takes place on the time scale of three milliseconds. And the ground state uh, is the mostly occupied, and the excited state uh, is uh, well, 20%, uh, one, uh, one, 20 at, uh, one time in 20 is in the excited, excited state. Okay, so that's, for, of course, for us uh, MD people, uh, three milliseconds is infinity. So are we going to see 
this very long change time scale with our method. And before I do that, I have to uh, explain a little bit uh, another issue. So oh, that, again, that comes from the experiment. So what they realize that in going from the monomer to the dimer, the major change is related to a particularly uh, residues, which is called isoleucine, huh? and which comes, changes conformation. And that uh, shows here. So this is, uh, uh, these are the three helices. That's isoleucine. In the dimer, it's like this. In the trimers, uh, it has made a conformation, so it can better, better uh, bind to the substrate. So we'll follow the change in the dihedral angle of this isoleucine as a marker of the state of dynamical state of the system. So we use our technique, uh, well tempered ensemble, or parallel tempering. Now the number of replica is uh, not longer 80, but something like 10 with our technique. And we look at this uh, distribution. So this is a typical run. Uh, it's a sampling, so the time is not, uh, not a, has no real value. Uh, and we see that most of the time it is here in a, in a the hydra, for occupying the hydra angle, which is similar to the ground state. But occasionally, it can go into a conformer which is uh, similar to the triplet state. So this changes. So that's the excited state. I mean, the number they have to take about theory and experiment, the, the large error bars. But we are in the right ball path. And interesting enough, we find that there is also this particular state uh, populated. But uh, the lifetime of this state, it's very short. If we start an MD from one of these conformer, it goes back here. So in very fast, in the order of, I think, nanoseconds. So NMR people cannot see this, uh, this excited state. But when we do even long simulation, like under nanosecond, starting from here, the system remains in this conformer. So there are two states. And uh, uh, indeed, so we can uh, or study the mechanism by which uh, this uh, occurs. So we look at our three helices. That's from the side, and that's from the top. And so there are subtle changes there that take place. So this thing is lifted because of this uh, unstructured loop by the presence of the thing. And uh, the, the distance, so there are these three helices, and uh, the, 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 the relative position changes a little bit. So these are all very subtle changes, nothing. Uh, so again, the same thing, the three helices. That's uh, the isoleucine. And uh, the, the motion that takes place uh, is something like that. So that's how it is. Nothing dramatic. But to measure, to measure this uh, opening, I mean, it is these three helices that are together. They will open a little bit, uh, and uh, the isolation can swing open. Uh, we use it, you know, whatever. That's a take uh, the moment of inertia, or whatever. And this is a CV that measures how close or how far are the three helices. Uh, we can draw, draw the free energy surface. So this is uh, a variable that measures how the three helices uh, uh, are, uh, are open or high. And the other measures the position of this loop. Huh? When the loop is in the high position, the inertia moment is the largest change. So that's more easy for the guy. But it can also be in other, in other things. Uh, things move, flexible. So in the dynamical manifold of, of the dimer, there are conformations 
in which uh, this thing is open, and when it is open, the isoleucine can more easily uh, swing position, can calculate the difference in free energy, as a function of data. It's a very small but measurable difference in free energy. So this opening and, and that. So there is nothing automatic. It's not a machine that you put there and then the motion is propagated. It's more subtle. It's uh, the presence of the of the of the um, allosteric ligand changes uh, really the tail of the dynamical distribution of states, and therefore enhances the probability that uh, the wanted event of binding of a third part and comes place uh, takes place. Okay, so that's why it is there. I think I have been, uh, that's uh, more or less uh, uh, what I wanted to tell you today. And uh, here I've gone uh, probably too fast. So, but uh, most of the things, uh, essentially all the tools that I, I told you about, <coughs> they can be used by anybody. You go to this site, now there's a version 2.0, and uh, you can interface this plugin with many codes, both uh, classical and also ab initio, like uh, Quantum Espresso or CPMD, CP2K also is, uh, should be added uh, to the list. And you're welcome to play with this method, which we are having a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice, as usual. Um, so I always like to talk to you about the collective variables, and and uh, and I thought it was interesting that you're working, and it makes a lot of sense to work on some automatic means of determining the appropriate collective variables. And I was wondering, uh, it I mean, so there are two approaches, as you pointed out. One is is to think about the physics of the problem, and and of course. From our point of view, that's much nicer uh, because it would be nice to be able to always be thinking about what is it that's driving some process, yeah. right, physically. Uh, from the mathematical point of view, um, people would be, uh, pr perspective, people would like that less because they worry about bias in choice of, 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 a, of a set of collective variables. So, um, so one possibility for an automated way, which a mathematician might uh, prefer, uh, to determine the appropriate collective variables is, is to do some kind of decomposition of the, of, of the um, underlying uh, coordinates, right? Atomic coordinates, something like a single, singular value decomposition or something like that. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so I'm curious to know whether uh, that's uh, the approach you're, you're thinking about. and. And whether that can work. I mean, I, I kind of like the idea, but you may lose the insight that you want. No, sure, sure. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there is uh, always a trade-off uh, in uh, in life, uh, as you rightly pointed out. Or if you do automatic, uh, we uh, for this system, uh, a singular value decomposition does not work. Simply. So. And, yeah. and that's because there are just so many. Yes, no, no, yes, yes. And yeah. so what happens here, then you see our, our coordinate changes, explores billions of conformation. Yeah. So we, we have, we means uh, us, uh, then uh, my former student, uh, Michele Ceriotti, who is now Lausanne, and Gareth Tribello, who is in Belfast. Now uh, we started working when the, we were all together in the same. Uh, yeah, but now people have uh, dispersed, but still we do some collaboration. And so uh, it's a bit, uh, I, I have to wave my hands. I don't want to see the mathematics. But uh, uh, so what we do, we, we start with the, with the, say, local minimum. And we do some kind of the local, uh, 
decomposition, but not global, locally. So we look at the fluctuations and we push the system out of this minimum. Uh, then we have a way of determining when you left uh, the minimum, you moved into the other, and then you do the same. And then you move here, you, you do the same. So you explore the ultimate stable state. Uh, at the end of this process, uh, you find this, uh, a series of local coordinates, so the starry, huh? uh, a starry sky of local coordinates, which you have to put together. Okay, so. And then uh, the second step in this strategy, we put that together using a dimensional reduction, which we have, uh, we have sort of adapted to the structure of the data that we have here, because you have to look, always look at the, at the physics. So the structure of the data, especially for protein, it's very different from what they use in other things, because if you look at things in the Ramachandran plot, you, you know that there are favorite things, and then occasionally moves. So it's more like blobs. And so we adapted this uh, 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 it's a method which we call sketch map, to do that, and that will give us uh, as collective variables. And then you need the method for this collective variable uh, to do the thing. It's all a bit complicated, so uh, uh, which, uh, you need an extension of metadynamics, which is called field theory metadynamics. But it requires a, a, a one-hour talk, and I think uh, people would be bored with <laughs> it. But this is to give you the philosophy of what we are trying to do. And so when you do dimension reductions, you, you often can lose information, right? So, so the question is, so are you te you're testing that the new collective variables you get are... are yeah, yeah, sure, sure. There sure. must be, you have to have, again, some automated way of deciding whether you've reduced too far. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. And there's no... Blank uh, right. uh, things, right. black box. So no, you have to to think. Okay. So also, if I may add uh, something, uh, because of this, in well tempered, uh, you have this notion of fluctuations. Huh? <coughs> you don't really necessarily need uh, to have uh, the right uh, collective coordinate. You want to. In, in, if you go from A to B, you want to enhance the local fluctuation, so the, the system goes, doesn't need even to go over the barrier. You want to bring it high enough for that the probability of going spontaneously uh, is high. So it's not so, so severe. I mean, it's not like in, uh, when you do, um, uh, I mean, in chemistry, you need to have the right, uh, uh, reaction coordinate, otherwise it's all wrong. You need to be sort of, uh, Italian way, approximate. So, for instance, if I last comment, in, in the case of the alanine dipeptide, there's been work by Chandler and this group, uh, where they show that uh, phi psi alone, they are not uh, good reaction coordinate. There is another, the hydro angle involved. Uh, but you see, for the determination of the free energy, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's a detail. So they're roughly right, but uh, with other things that uh, take part, the method takes care. Of course, if there is a very strong variable, then you're lost. Yep, yes. Yeah, uh, protein, most of the time, is uh, due to a local environment, change in the environment. Um, in the uh, yeah, yeah, yes, in, in, yeah, yeah, no. in many cases, uh, for instance, uh, a thing which is extremely important is solvation. So, uh, in, in cases we had to put the variables that represent, the, say, if you have an enzymatic center, yeah. I mean, you need to take out the water and bring, or bring them in or whatever. I was also thinking to the metals or 
ions in the in solution. I mean, yeah, we do have everything. We do have everything. In fact, uh, my Giovanni Bussi from Modena, uh, now at uh, Trieste, is interested in uh, in RNA. And uh, what he uses as a collective variable there uh, is the uh, uh, the Western Boltzmann distribution, the electric field, because I mean RNA is highly charged, so there is a screening charge around it, and the potential electrostatic potential associated with that, and he has been using this electrostatic potential to as a collective variable. Indeed, I mean, there is one of the young men who is going to receive a prize later on, uh, Vittorio Limongelli there, and, uh, who has uh, indeed found things. And uh, 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 we gave this, uh, this prediction to the experimentalist, and they found that the uh, calculation was correct, was, prediction was correct. There are several examples. Of, of successes. <laughs> 